listen, if I get killed, my blood is on your hand. Just don't get it on my shoe, okay? Dad uses the term with me. He's like, yeah, whatever, P-O-K. And I was like, what's P-O-K? Piece of cake. I've never heard that before. Well, I guess because you've never been a man before. Ah! What exactly is a Delmarva circumnavigation? It is a sailing test for the ASA 106 because of the offshore component. It's about 400 miles. The uh, sailing schools do it in eight days. But Dad and I want to do it in such a way that we are not stopping, but they were pushing through and doing overnight passages to see what that's like. We start here. We go north up Chesapeake Bay. All the way up here. We transverse the CND Canal. We come down the Delaware River. We go offshore into the Atlantic, circle back around, and land back in Norfolk. But first, let's talk about charts and maps. Maps we use on roads, and charts we use on water. Charts give you more information in terms of what do you need to know for your boat. Now, this is a chart, and as I zoom in, there are, for years, there was paper charts, of course, now with electronics. Well, now we have electronic charts, and there's some discussion about which one's better. Paper charts uh, are still supported by NOAA, but they are not as readily available as they once were. But I digress. Let's take a look. What do we need to know? So you see the red and the green? These are called channel markers. Now, when you're leaving a channel, the red should always be on your left and the green should be on your right. Okay, so left is port, right is starboard. In this particular situation, we're going to be leaving here and heading through this channel. and out. So the red buoys will be on our left side or port. Port is red. And here's the green ones and they're going to be on our right. Now the other thing we're going to be watching for is depth. See this number here? This number eight? That's how deep the water is. Why is that important? Because Bob needs six feet and one inch to keep from hitting ground. The reason why all these numbers are scattered around over here in the blue, these are to tell boaters just how deep the water is. Every boat is different. Some only need one foot. Some need ten feet. Some need even more than that. But the question is, what does your boat need and what does the chart say? Okay. And again, as we come out of the channel, we're going to go this way. And we're going to stay between the green and the red. Because, generally speaking, that sh is designated as safe water. This water outside the channel is 6 feet. Here it's 3 feet. Over here it's 9 feet. So sometimes people want to come out of the channel. The problem is, is that outside of the channel, it can't always be guaranteed. You better stay in the channel, particularly right there. So we're coming out the channel. And again, we're watching the depths. We're going to come out here. And now this is a lot of traffic through here, right? So we're going to go over top of the Norfolk Tunnel. 56 feet, 63 feet. So we're good. We've got plenty of water under us, right? And we're going to head on out and go north, okay? The first thing we're going to see as we're heading north is Thimble Shoal Channel. It's going to be the first bit, or I'm sorry, Thimble Shoal Channel Light. And it's going to be this lighthouse that's 
right there in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. Now that we have a somewhat of a course and you guys understand, let's go get ready. There were three projects we needed to complete before we could depart. One was putting batteries in for the bow thruster. Two was installing the Starlink so we could test offshore internet capability. And three, I had to build some shelves to store all our tools. The batteries were huge and required a few people to bring them in. Quarters or something it, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked over 11. Yeah, I looked up the size for it and gave it the sizes. How heavy are they, Dad? 70, 80 pounds at least. Oh, at least. By 100. Yeah, if they were that heavy, I wouldn't be able to lift them. Alright, you need to go first? Yeah, because you got the battery in. Oh, this is bad. Yeah. You can squish. I didn't mean to get stuck up here, actually. So go ahead. Piece of cake. This is not a dream. Okay. Why am I posting a video of my car? Because... It has Starlink on the hood, well, on the top, but it's just in a box and I'm taking it to the boat to see if we can get the Starlink to work on boat. Okay, the box is open and can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. I gotta put this over here. It comes with this guy. That's the dish itself. That's the anchor. It does the anchor. Well, yeah, you could drive nails in here, I guess, into the ground. Screws. You see that? Yeah. All right, and here's the dish. Uh -huh. And you hold that up. Yeah, sure. Notice it's a fixed thing. Once you set the angle, it stays there. Oh, here, it goes in that, but that's sitting on top of the... Here. Just don't let it fall over until we can see it's on this thing. Yeah, I got here, it. You want to lift it up and I'll pull it out. Alright, this is the Starlink dish. It looks like a whiteboard. And it's not gimbal. And it's not gimbaled as dad is pointing out. So, let's see. If it was gimbaled, it still needs to be able to track a single satellite, which is a target of one of 1700. Okay. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna see what happens. Okay? Router, yeah. All right, so it comes with a router, a Wi-Fi router. Okay, cool. And you wanna hold up the directions? One, two, two three. three. Right. Okay. Couldn't be simpler. Until Allegedly. You move the position. Okay, well, hold on. Inside the rest of the box is just the cords and the cables. That's it. That's all it's needed. And oh, a little. Oh, maybe this is some more specific directions. Yeah. Regulatory notices. All right. But you need a phone app. Hold on. Because this Starlink is for a stationary system that doesn't move. Now, even the RV one won't track you while you're bouncing down the road, okay? It, when you stop, it'll, it'll find it's fixed, right? We want one that is going to be, like, tracking 24-7, 365. So why don't we put it on a gimbaled mount? Have you seen the gimbal mounts for those? No, but that doesn't mean we can't. One Point thing... the camera right over there. Okay, hold on. The track vision. The yeah, track phone. that one. <laughs> Dad says we need a, a dome. 
I don't well, know. If you want a gimbal, if you want 24-7 data, okay, even, even our current one gets iffy if you're rolling around, okay, or if you're underway. A few moments later. So I found this old uh, fishing rod holder and I checked the diameter. And it is going to match within a very close space the uh, Starlink post. I'm trying to decide if I should pop that out or cut that out and let the wire run through. I'm trying to figure this out. And I sort of hollowed out that. Probably going to sand it down a little bit. But, as you can see, I should be able to run the cable cord right down through there. So, hold on. Obviously not going to have the, the power cord there. I just want to see if it's going to fit. And then what am I going to need to cinch it down? Y'all know how much I like foam. I might actually pour some foam in there. Oh, there's the back side. Okay, hold on. And here's the opposite view. And the thing about this little weird device is it actually does move. It has a motor in there. I don't know if I'll catch it moving. I'd love to catch it moving. And there's the side view. All right, so the next thing I need to do really, which is boring to watch and I'm not gonna video it, is um, run that wire. One hour later. The, the Wi-Fi speed right now, 469.70. Okay. 462. Wow. Oh yes, we're gonna have to go right to ludicrous speed. <gasps> <laughs> Starlink is up and ready. Time for those shelves. It's a really quick set of shelves that I built to put inside the forward closet where we could store tools in a more organized and secure way. So much more space than what we had. It used to be a hanging locker for clothes, but we really have way more tools than we do that clothes needing a hanging locker. So. Mission accomplished. Uh, well, I'm done. I'm finished. Uh, what do you think? What is it? Well, it's a shoe rack with a twist. Uh, you ready? You just turn a crank here, those drop back, these split, and it comes from behind. Gives you twice Stop the space. Stop boring me with your absurdities. And just like that, we were ready to go. I guess it's time to go, huh? Well, I thought we were. Well, yeah. I just wanted to do the solar, the, the Wi-Fi check. Okay, all right. Are you ready then? Yeah. You want me to start the engine? No. Uh, you taking the boat out? Are we taking the boat out? Are you taking the boat out? No. I mean, unless you want me to. That's kind of a change in our normal routine. Yeah. I what know. would I do if you weren't barking at me from the helm? <laughs> I guess it's time. It's a little weird. It's almost two years to the day that we bought the boat. Almost two years. I'm going to try to do a test run of the Starlink powered up by the solar power. If you don't know what Starlink is, it's that satellite internet that Elon Musk has been launching into outer space. So, um, looks like we're going to be motoring quite a bit. And, um, hell, Demol, Delmar the Loop. I'm not sure what we're going to, we might find in Anchorage. I hope this is an interesting episode. Take it to see Mr. Murdoch. Let's stretch your legs. Yes, sir.
When two ships are meeting, you always pass port to port, or left hands to left hands. Unless the ships talk over radio and decide otherwise. Like this big ship. So he hailed us on the radio and said, fall off to starboard. We both took it to mean our starboard, which meant that we crossed his bow, so we could pass port to port, which would have been right, but this was also wrong, because, look, he's huge, and didn't really want to pass in front of his bow, but that is what he said. Then he got on the radio and said we were dangerous, and that was wrong, and that was bad, and Dad just radioed him back and said, you're the one that said starboard. through just yelling at people. So from then on, we heard him on the radio telling which boats starboard. Okay. So, here we are. Over here, coming out of this channel. Do, 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 coming through here. And we're going to take a left or turn to port. And remember all those cranes that we saw in the, in the video? Those are all over here. And this is that tunnel. So we're going to cross over top of the tunnel. Can't really tell. It's really just a bunch of brick, like, brick raw rocks that are up on that wall. You can't really see that it's a tunnel. But, um, to give you guys some an idea. And then we're going to head north up Chesapeake Bay. We're going to head... Oh, oops. North. But right there is the Thimble Shoal Channel Light. So we know there's a big channel, and we're going to talk about that because we're going to come back through this channel. But right now we're just going to go past this light. And uh, I found some fun stuff on um, YouTube. Somebody had wrote a song about Thimble Shoal. So as we get closer, I'll tell you the history and just a little bit about the lighthouse. <clears throat> okay. So here is 2022's version of Thimble Shoal Channel Light. It's today's version. And I say that because this little Thimble Light has a huge history. For starters, let's talk about why it's called Thimble Shoal Light. This right here is Thimble Shoal. Now the reason why it's called a shoal is because it gets very shallow very quick here right so we have 41 feet 32 feet and then suddenly as soon as you pass this line 13 feet which okay for bob it's not a big deal because bob only needs like six feet but some of these big container ships and cargo ships and let's go historically warships needed a lot more water than 13 feet they had to stay here, right? And so, Thimble Shoal Light is not named Thimble Shoal Light because of the shape of the lighthouse. This is the Thimble Shoal Channel that comes through here. And it's basically, right here, it's saying, stop, big ships, don't pass, go. Don't go straight. You gotta go left or right 
or port or starboard. But do not, under any circumstances, pass the lighthouse if you need more than 20 feet of water under your keel. Because then you're doomed. I also found a song. Pay attention to the lyrics. We're going to talk about them. A ship came down on a stormy night. Oh, oh. Broke her toe and set to flight. Oh, oh. Smashed into me, but I put her right. Oh, oh. oh. Only one of us won that fight. Oh. So the song talks about Thimble Shoal when it was hit by a vessel that broke free from a tow. That vessel was called the Malcolm Baxter Jr. It was a stormy night on December 27th, 1909. When Malcolm Baxter Jr. broke loose, it hit Thimble Shoal Light three times. Once with the bow, the midships, and the stern. The last hit was fatal. It knocked over the stove which caught fire and burned down the lighthouse. The tow vessel, here's a model of it here, was the John Tuhi. Malcolm Baxter Jr. was towed to Norfolk, repairs were made, and it went back to sea. But that's not the end. In 1920, it emerges again as the subject of a U.S. Supreme Court case. You want to overturn the verdict altogether because it's not the company's fault that the ship's captain got drunk, but he was a drunk, and they knew it. That's enough history. Let's get back to the Del Mar the Loop. When you see them on the spreaders, <laughs> no, no spreader waves. Yes, yeah, spreaders. That, no spreader waves. Spread, yeah, that's... Dad's saying that when you see the waves up the spreader, you see these little waves. These feel big to me right now. Let me show you what Dad means by waves going as high as the spreader. Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna back up, and I'm gonna. That is the spreader. No waves that big. That would be about a 20 foot wave. Oh, hell no. I'm good with little these little two foot waves. And look at how Bob is bouncing. Doing. Oh. <laughs> It's very rolly out here. It is today. There's not much wind, but it's rolly. It's kind of interesting. Are we through the channel? Did you? I don't know. You want to navigate? No, you. <laughs> I'm not autopilot. <laughs> uh, Take a picture of that. It's easy to be happy on a boat during the day, but when night falls, things change. I don't know why I'm so excited about going and sailing at night, but I am. There's Bob with his little solar lights to help us see our way around. Dad doesn't see very good in the dark. So. Good evening, this is the northbound ship, Toledo Triumph. I'm showing a pretty tight CPA. If 
you wouldn't mind opening up to starboard, um, that would be very helpful. You would like us to... Okay, uh, do you have a distance right now? I don't see you on my plot. I'm a, I'm a 1,200 foot container ship off your port quarter. Wow! Gotcha. We're going to appear to starboard a bit. Thank you. Alright, thank you. Uh, told you he was talking about us. 1200! 1200 feet? Yeah. Holy shit! A few moments later. So there it is, the 1200 foot vessel that I actually thought was Tangier Island. My dad is up in the cockpit and he has the helm for a couple of hours, so it's his watch. I'm exhausted. We've been, at, we've been at it for, it feels like days, but it's just been night one for the first day, but I was up really late last night and up again early this morning, and so I am falling asleep. Oh, fuck, 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 I gotta go. Dad! I don't know what's happening. Okay, I don't, I don't know, I'll see you guys later. Okay, bye. is all I have to say. Um, I woke up, I heard the boom, I went up above, I, I grabbed the flashlight, we have a spotlight, I grabbed the spotlight, I did not have my phone, there is no video of this. I I, um, I asked my dad what was going on, he's like, I have no idea. Um, we put the boat in neutral, and I shined the light out. Now keep in mind, we had probably 40 knot winds and definitely white caps and spray is wet and um you know the boat's sideways and i take the light and i f i shine it out into the water and there are stakes like this coming out of the water surrounding the boat and uh, <laughs> I was like, holy shit. I had a knife in my pocket uh, that Richie had given me, actually, and I went around to the back of the boat and I shined the light and I saw the dinghy wrapped up in uh, one of those stakes and I had to cut it loose in order for us to get loose. So I cut loose the dinghy and we were able to drift out. We kept the boat in neutral. We were able to drift out around the so we had the, you know, the claws coming out of the water and then around it, a crab pot island, a crab pot like city, fucking crab pots in this, you know, crashing and wind is blowing and it's extremely wild and rather indescribable. We drifted out. We were, fortunately the wind was coming um, from our starboard side and it kind of pushed us to port so we were able to get clear of the, what I now believe was a fishing trap and the crab pots. I still, it's still so very blurry. Anyway, um, I'm going to go try to get another hours of sleep. I'm still exhausted and, um, dad's going to continue and we're going to stay in the channel. I want to make a note though. We were barely outside of the channel and the reason we pulled outside of the channel was because of the amount of ships and the size of the ships that are in the shipping lanes, just like that 1200 foot vessel that was just right behind us. So we were right outside of the channel, probably, I don't know, 30 feet, maybe, if that. So something to think about. Anyway, I'm going back to sleep. I'm exhausted and we'll see you in the morning. Six hours later. I have a confession to make. And the boat was like. <laughs> I need to go to the bathroom. And I couldn't get down below. I pee my pants. I'm just gonna say it. I pee my pants. When he gets nervous, he sometimes wets his pants. Thank you for your time. There. Right up Bob's nose. 
go between those two big pillars right there. Yes. Yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah, and it's rough. part of the bridge. Oh god. And the low level so it was lower than our mast. So I had to deploy the nesting dinghy. The put nesting. the anchor in it, row out, drop the anchor, pull ourselves down. Oh my god. Yeah. We're getting sucked up underneath the bridge. Uh, the That's narrow part. It didn't happen this time. So we had to alter course and get out of the channel because he shaved the buoy so close. I'm so glad we did that. And we were being nice. But my question is, what is that? Is that an airplane fuselage? A rocket? Okay, what is it? Requiring minds want to know. What is it, guys? That's what I was thinking. You know, NASA has a little uh, place out here. Yeah. It might be a rocket. On day three now, day three, and just getting ready to go into the CND Canal. I guess it's the first buoy. May not be. That number on that buoy is 29. So we're gonna look at where it's at on the chart. The CND Canal. It connects Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. Basically, it connects the Chesapeake Bay, which includes Annapolis, Baltimore, and Norfolk. If you wanted to avoid the shore. You would take the CND Canal to Chesapeake Bay and then all the way south. This is the beautiful fall colors in Maryland. And that's again another channel marker to let us know to stay away from that area. It's shallow and the channel on the chart, it'll give you the channel depth. For those of you who don't know, Bob is six feet one inch deep. I like to keep it above 6.5. I don't like to press it. All right, looks like there's a boat coming up on our horizon. Anytime you're coming into a narrow channel, right? The uh, the rules of the road were to say, everybody passes port to port. Nobody knows what that means if you're not a boater. What it means is your left hands meet. Kind of like when you're driving. Bridges where it shows, we have plenty of clearance. We need 55 feet. So there's plenty of clearance except 45 feet on this one that's a railway bridge always a note on the chart so I called the Corps of Engineers and they said the bridge is always lifted so it lifts up they said it's always lifted unless there's a train coming through so if there's a train coming through the bridge will be down but it goes right back up afterwards so we'll be keeping an eye on that and if it is down we'll call channel 13 that's who monitors it and it's also a phone number and I found all of that tons of information in the coast pilot and which is like the thing you use, it's like a, a, a boat person's Bible, basically. It's gonna give you all kinds of interesting information.
come and have a snack. So we went back and had snacks. We did. And uh, so now it's next morning and we gotta get going. So dad's over at the bathroom. And when he gets back, we're gonna talk to him and see what he says about our departure, which I know he wants to leave with the blood being tied so that we aren't bucking a current. Stay tuned. left Schaefer's and headed down C&D Canal into Delaware River. C&D Canal was kind of boring. Actually, Schaefer's was the most exciting thing about it, but I admit that it was exciting to be that far north and to be at the middle of our trip. So there was three bridges. The last one was the most riveting because it's a lift bridge and it lifts up and it stays up unless it's down and allows a train to cross it. Otherwise, it goes back up and stays there. Really? We've gone that far already? How well, fast are we going? About seven. riveting part about this trip is not knowing where we're going to go when we get out here. And the 
mast fits. She got to admit, it's a little intimidating. Uh... Yep. Stay. So you're both boat dogs. Buddy, we've already asked what you think. We're not going to talk about the embarrassing stuff. What do you think about the cool stuff? Yeah, like stopping and anchoring. You were really into supervising and anchoring, right? Yeah. And uh, you definitely like the scenery, like, like how you're looking at stuff right now. What about you, Badger? So we know you're camera shy, but it's not on. The camera's not on, right? It's just you. You like being a boat dog, don't you? Badger is steady Eddie in that storm. Boat's going all over the place. Badger's just laying in her bed. Doo -doo -doo. She doesn't give two shits. Nope. I think she likes being a boat dog. What about Poncho? Little shit. You see him in there? Laying next to Dad in his little bed. Yeah. Alright, so here we are at the end of the CMD Canal. Where it enters, so this would be the east end. Where it enters the Delaware River. The Delaware River will take that south down to the mouth of the, well, basically to the end of the Delaware River and then into the Atlantic Ocean, which I'm kind of scared about. So, it has these rocks that come out here. I don't know if you can see that. And it's the same on the other side. Delaware River. So it's definitely a little, a little lively out here right now. You can hear the wind. Um, or not. We'll see the spray, but we've definitely got some gusts. What do you think of this? Wow. I kind of wasn't expecting this on the on the river. But I guess it makes sense if you think about how close it is to the Atlantic. Yes. I don't think I've ever seen Bob bury the bow like that. Really? You saw Bob bury the bow? Bob bow was in the water. Right on. I, we're definitely getting water over the right over the on. bow. I know. how far up ahead he is. You don't want to get between those two things. That's bad. Yeah. That's how big it is. Jeez. 
on a barge. My question is, why is it on a barge? Where's, where's the ship? Oh. Is that it? I wonder if that's a designated anchorage over there. No, but I'm, I'm just off of the channel. I don't want to be in the channel. I know. Hard to see in the video and that's why I did it this way. Here is a green light. Okay. I'm gonna make a circle around the green light. Hey, bye My dad's not excited about doing a night anchor east. In fact, quite pissed that we didn't anchor earlier. I was like, whatever, I had a headache today, so I just didn't nap. I like, I thought we'll always be there by 9.30. Oh, yeah. oh. Sorry, I looked it up on Navionics, and it looks like a pretty clean entrance. So, hopefully we'll get anchored. Until then, I'm on watch, and I'm not getting glasses, y'all. It's it's not as bad as it was the other night. Like the other night was really scary, um, but it's still just gives you this kind of this feeling like you have no idea what's happening around you, and you just have no choice but to just sit here and wait for it, and read your chart and position, and just make sure you keep the mood out of peril. Red light. Flashing red light. Like a circle. Ideally we would go right in between those channel markers. Okay, keep in mind that we were coming down the Delaware River like this. And then our plan was to anchor over here. Right, so 
that's basically what you should be seeing or understanding in this video but obviously it's a lot harder to see that and it's a lot harder to understand keep in mind that the charts have descriptions of these lights two hours later All of a sudden, we hear this scraping noise, and I'm like, shit, slam the boat into reverse. Dad and I quickly switch places. He yells, go down below, check for damage. Next thing I know, my phone rings, and it's Richie, and I tell him, I can't talk, I think we hit rocks, and I hang up the phone. Richie called back, but I couldn't answer because my hands were full. So unbeknownst to us, he called the Coast Guard. Meanwhile, we assessed the damage. There was a small leak. We couldn't quite tell exactly where it was coming from. We only know it was coming from the bow. We were able to get clear of the rocks or whatever we hit and anchor the boat. So far, one worried husband has gotten three Coast Guard vessels, one Coast Guard helicopter, and a towboat. One phone call from one worried When the Coast Guard showed up, they wanted to make sure the boat was not in peril. So they boarded and inspected. Yeah, of course. What I have you look at you guys name now, Chris? Sure, Nicholas Black. Nicholas Black, God's a And I... C-H-O-L-A-S. Yes. That's Middle initials. 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 After they left, we talked to the towboat guy and decided to follow him to Angler's Marina so we could pull out the boat and assess the damage. The next day. Spreader lights are on. Well, I cut them all off. You put them on. Oh. I wouldn't mess with it just yet. Assessing the damage, we saw damage at the bow thruster and this uh, scratch here going down the front of the bow. We pulled the boat out, put it up on the hard at Angler's Marina, and then took another closer look at the bow thruster and here at the tube. When we had it installed, they fiberglassed over bottom paint, and one of our viewers complained, so they took it out, but apparently they filled it with putty. Instead of repairing the fiberglass, they just filled the space out with filler, putty, which explains why it cracked and why it was leaking and how it could have sunk the boat. This is that green light that we saw from a distance and these are the rocks that are spilling out into the waterway. When I asked him how come it hasn't been fixed, he said, and I quote, no one has died yet. He also said we should be proud of our boat because and I quote, most boats don't make it after hitting those rocks. I am proud of Bob, and I'm pretty sure Bob is proud of Bob. When they pulled him out of the lift, I think Bob was like flexing at the other boats. So I got right to work, got my tools, and much to the surprise at the always men working in the marina, I fixed Bob. First I grinded him down, and then I refiberglassed. I used some biaxial fiberglass with the G-Flex strengthened epoxy. That was strong. I also added a couple of extra layers and beefed up the area where we would most likely strike if it happened again. Three weeks later, Bob is fixed. Um, and I look, I didn't get into the whole how I fixed it. Um, because I did so much last summer and I kind of just showed you guys basically I grinded out the spots um, put on some more fiberglass I did use something a little different I used the G flex epoxy on uh, some fiberglass to see along the bottom and when I went to sand that down whoa 
strong. So when I do take Barb out and do some more fiberglass, I'm gonna go on the bottom and fill it all out, level it up, and then and then add some some of the G Flex epoxy and fiberglass because it that shit was like bulletproof. Now I'm on my way back to Hampton to pick up my dad, and then our Bob is launching tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We're probably gonna anchor out and then head offshore. And when we anchor out, I'm not really sure. Oh, oops my car drives okay. so we're gonna make a drink called Bob on the Rocks to uh, commiserate I mean memorialize uh, on how this happened and um, try to celebrate a little bit because Bob really Bob was okay and thanks to my newly fashioned fiber dusting skills ha, I fixed it right up so the little zombie bites gone like I blew a blood vessel in my eye. I don't know if you guys can see that. So I've been walking. It's getting better. But like before today, I'm walking around I'm like this zombie eye. Hello. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> the next day. So while dad was out of commission, I was up above, alone, in the cockpit, and did a systems check of the Starlink. And here's the Starlink test. I had planned on doing it way before now, but such as the way things worked out, we didn't really get a chance to do it until we were offshore. So while dad's sick, I'm going to take the opportunity and do this. The internet speed from Starlink topped out at 141 megabytes per second. Dad says that's high, that's fast, that's a lot. I don't really know, but I do know that we could stream movies, and I was pretty happy about that. And now it's time to do the Wi-Fi speed, <clears throat> which to me is the important one, but Dad assures me that that's not the case. And already this is up to 400 and it looks like 60... Maybe it'll hit 70 megabytes per second. I think that's really fast. If anybody knows anything about internet, let me know. Translate this for me. Well, the Starlink test is done. I'm gonna go down and check on Dad. See how he's doing. 
Oh God, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> yep, still sick, which means I have to get ready for the night shift. Weird, in all in one shot, you have the sunset and the moon. It's all gone. I think it's... <laughs> Poor dad, still sick. But I didn't have much time to think about it because something unexpected happened. I'm gonna leave you some clues. Y'all try to figure out what it was. Well, how'd you do? Did you figure it out? Did you put all the clues together? Any ideas? If you guessed the mizzen boom fell off, you'd be right. <laughs> Actually, it's funny now, but it definitely wasn't funny then. Dad was able to grab the helm. I grabbed a dock line, lassoed the boom, secured it to the mast, and crisis was averted. Dad's hiatus from vomiting didn't last long, and before I knew it, he was back at it. The entire digestive system collapses, accompanied by uncontrollable flagellants, until finally the poor bastard is reduced to a quivering, wasted piece of jelly. <laughs> like an hour later, check this out. Here's a quick clip of our handheld radio, and it's on channel 16. Why am I showing you this? Well, I'm gonna tell ya. The Coast Guard came on there and told all the ships that were in this vicinity, including ours, to stop moving because there was going to be, get this, a rocket launch. Yep, a rocket launch. Remember that big fuselage we saw on the barge? Is it possible that's the same rocket that's launching in an hour? And three weeks later, we are at the same place at the same time again? On the same night that dad had food poisoning and the boom fell off? Really? This is Twilight Zone stuff, guys. You're traveling through another dimension. And it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. SS Sally Ride spacecraft from the NASA Wallops flight facility. The Antares rocket launched about an hour ago. It was right around 5.30 this morning. It's loaded with science and supplies, science equipment and supplies, headed for the International Space Station. A lot of you were able to catch a glimpse of that this morning. Very cool. It was 5.30 in the morning. 
I was tired. I wanted a break and some coffee. And Dad said, well, he could take over. I'm your huckleberry. Oh, I wasn't quite as sick as I made out. You didn't have to tell me twice. I went below and made some coffee. Now the forbidden fruit must be tasted. Well, when Maury told me what you were willing to do, I... <laughs> While down below, we got hit broadside by a pretty big wave. I went flying, and the coffee went flying. I fell and smacked my thumb. My thumb looks something like this. Yep. And, uh, I really didn't have much of a choice, so I shoved it back into place. Kind of like this. I didn't have any bandaging material, so I used a sock after I got it back into place, took some leave, and went back up. All we had left was turning from the Atlantic Ocean into Chesapeake Bay, over the tunnel, into Thimble Shoal Channel, and to see our friend Thimble Shoal Channel Light. We are home. Well, the trip offshore was not uneventful, but as usual, Bob kind of held his own. I'm going to show you a couple of things before we wrap up this video. All right, so a quick walk around the outside after our trip. A couple of things that we did um, note was these marks from the fish trap. Okay, Bob has those all around the boat. They look like zombie scratches or something in the video there was a clip of a dinghy sort of floating away a little inflatable dinghy that was our little sailing tinder dinghy um, in order to get free that night I had to cut it loose because it was wrapped around one of those fish trap poles so we picked up a used little two horse inflatable little two horse engine and a little inflatable dinghy in Lewis, Delaware River before we went offshore just because we didn't want to go offshore without a dinghy. Okay, hang on. Again, more of those marks from the pylon, those fish trap poles, posts, I'm not sure what to call them, but as you can see, they pretty much, like in the video, I wasn't really able to show you guys the extent but when I shine the light out there it was storming it was pretty wild and to shine the light out there and see these stakes coming out of the water was it was quite intense it was terrifying um, but I mean in my head there was a hole in the boat but uh, his uh, Brand new Keswick, Virginia nameplate. Definitely took a hit. As well as the Bob nameplate took a hit. And let's see. And there's some damage here. But again, most of it's just superficial. Now during the during the video you will see that I did a a clip of a mast falling. And obviously it was way less dramatic than, than what you saw in the movie. But here is a quick glimpse of the mizzen boom. I'm going to show you what happened here. It's connected with a part that's called a gooseneck and it has a cotter pin and then a little pin that goes inside the hole of the cotter pin. I'm going to show this to you. So we were taking about 10 foot waves right on the side and it was really rocking the boat and throwing the, the, the boom around. I mean I had it secure but it was just really rocking hard. Meanwhile, down below, Dad was throwing up, and I heard this big boom, again, another boom, and I came up, and the boom had detached and was swinging around. Obviously, I did not have time to grab my phone and get video of this. Um, instead, I went, oh, fuck. I yelled for Dad to come up and hold the, hold the course while I went out and lassoed it with my horsey girl skills. I lassoed it, pulled it in, and used the dock lines to secure it. So I need to get that repaired right away. All right, this is the sort of close-up view of the mizzen boom. 
this is the attach this is the gooseneck and basically it attaches with a cotter pin I'm going to show you this kind of cotter pin okay and as you can see at the end of this cotter pin right there's another little hole for another little pin and it goes in like this I don't want to put it all the way in because it was a little bit of a pain in the ass to get in and out okay it slides through and then is secured with this little pinholes, one on each side. Best I can tell, since I was unable to find any pins, they either popped off and went flying into the water or they were never there. And here's the thing, I never checked. So little things like this could, ca this could have been a really bad situation, with, especially with my dad sick, the boom flying around, I'm just glad that the nothing broke, that this was the extent of the damage. So this hopefully will get repaired quick. I'm not going to put it all the way in, but let me show you just one more time. Go underneath and show you what I'm talking about. All right, so this is the other part of the gooseneck that uh, this, the boom piece goes inside of here and then actually it goes around. And then the cotter pin slides through and then it's secured on both sides with those little pins that I cannot find. They're nowhere on the boat and um, so I don't know and shame on me for not checking prior to going offshore. Uh, I learned so much on this trip that it's like no problem, got it. So I need to do a little bit of rig inspection and making sure that nothing was actually damaged um, so as I look down right now I want you guys to see that the pin that secures the gooseneck in is also missing and I just now discovered that while doing this video so again inspect 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 and I will make sure all of these are secure is so tough that I think we can we can reasonably say that we're gonna be okay we just have to double check the systems double check the stuff that we haven't messed with with like those little cotter pins I mean small little things slip by that could have been an extremely extremely dangerous situation and it could have been catastrophic so I learned a lot uh, just watching the boom flying around and I'm so grateful for the full moon because I was really able to see it and um, get a get a get a rope on it I'm gonna say rope because I use horse girl skills to uh, rope up the boom and uh, strap it on get it tight and we got home fairly uneventfully with the exception of me dislocating my thumb right at the very end just as dad stopped puking see you guys next time Stay tuned if you want for a quick coffee with Bob. Okay, well, um, check it out. I'm on Bob, and uh, I am so glad to get this video done and uploaded. It has, first of all, it was a ridiculously long, and it took a, a lot of editing, a ton of editing and re-editing, and trying to piece it all together so that it made sense as a full story. I I'm extremely critical of my videos and I tend to watch them a lot uh, to look for mistakes. Notoriously I will upload one and then I'll go to see it and I'll be like shit I did it again. So I hope that is not the case this one because with an almost an hour and a half long there's it's, it's I'm just gonna I hope I don't miss something that's all. If I did I'm sorry in advance. Um, this is the season two finale, and I think I went ahead and did that even season two, season one. I don't even know why I do this. I do, I, I like to compartmentalize everything and I like goals. So for me, when I say season two finale, that was really the Delmarva loop. It was supposed to be last year, but this year we did it. And so now it's this year and it was the finale, even though the season itself was pretty short. I guess that's why you can do stuff like that if you're the creator. I don't know what year, what next year will bring, 
but I know the next video you're going to see season three and what does that mean? <clears throat> so there's a few more projects left to do. It's a boat. Uh, just a couple things. One, the bottom of Bob, look at my coffee cup. The bottom of Bob is uh, about that wide, about a foot and a half wide. And the last couple of times when I've been doing the fiberglass, <clears throat> I've noticed at the very, very bottom, there's these little divots up there. So I would like to sand down the very, very, very bottom and fill it in with um, probably some G-Flex G uh, epoxy, the West System G-Flex, which I'm a huge fan of, and uh, some thickener and some fiberglass shards and just kind of, and just kind of fill those in and buff them out. I just, I, I just don't know what's, where it's going. You know, I don't, I don't know what's, I don't, I don't know if there's anything that's a direct channel up into the boat or not. So those, what's one thing? <clears throat> we definitely need a wind generator, so that's coming up, and a water maker. Um, the fatality, or I'm not going to say fatalities, the casualties from season two. Um, it started actually over the summer. This, this, this. When I started fiberglassing, I did not realize how much epoxy would get into my hair. So right after we finished and launched Bob from the first repair, oh, I was like, yeah, and I kind of cut a few things out, but it was still not going well. It had just had a bunch of like sticky epoxy that was dried and cured in my hair. And then in Delaware, I was doing the very front like I kind of gave Bob that nose job and epoxy was dripping off of some of the fiberglass and I just really saturated it well and it dripped into a pile and then I went up underneath and I laid my head back and wham I put my ponytail in that puddle I literally literally took my fiberglassing scissors and cut chunks just cut it into chunks um, it's growing back. So that was one uh, casualty over the summer. And the other one, the saddest one of all, was the little dinghy. When we went into that fish trap, holy shit. Okay, first of all, holy shit. Bam! But I thought like the jaws were coming up out of the ocean floor. It was Chesapeake Bay floor, but whatever. And just swallowing Bob whole. I could not believe the stakes in the water just there and they have nets all around like intertwined in between them so we went plowing through we also took the net ting net ting uh so we pulled bob out in delaware there was like remnants of net hanging from the propeller from the prop i don't say propeller i don't know why i say propeller anyway from the prop uh so we got that all cleaned up and um, bob looks good going back into the water after getting attacked by uh, I call them zombies water zombies because of the marks that are still on the on the hull and then uh, when we ran onto the rocks I, what do you say it happened I, I couldn't pretend like it didn't happen I, I wasn't quite sure how to tell the story because obviously I didn't have my fucking phone on me like who has that I don't know how to get the really good stuff and then tell the story with it because I have no footage of it. The only thing I can do is tell you the story and then try to piece it together using bits and pieces. But anyway, so when I cut the dinghy loose, so I have to back up. So when we were in the fish trap and the dinghy was wrapped around one of those posts and it was tied, you know, to the boat, the line was extremely tight. I, there was no way I was going to untie it. There was no salvaging the dinghy. And uh, it just so happens that Richie had given me a knife that was in my pocket. And I was able to pull it out and cut the line and say bye to the little dinghy. I hope somebody got it and gave it a good home. I don't think it sank. It's been full of water more than once. And it doesn't sink. Uh, so I think it'll in its little wooden little dinghy. So with little black hole and red sails and it's very cute. I hope that it um, found a good home. Somebody that really loved it and is learning to sail on it. 
Uh, so that was the other casualty from from the summer, from season two. Those two major ca casualties were my hair and a little dinghy. We got a new dinghy. It's right there. I don't know if you can see it. It's cute. It matches the boat. It's an inflatable. We found it used. Um, probably should have videoed that. Met the guy up in Lewis, Delaware. He was from Pennsylvania. We bought it. He brought it down. It was really great. We did not want to go offshore without a dinghy. I certainly didn't. Not after. I just didn't know. You know, I didn't. I didn't know what was going to happen, and I'd never done it before. So I was extremely worried about going offshore and just checking, checking all the boxes, which is probably a good thing I did because Dad getting sick. Bleh, bleh. For like almost 24 hours, he was down below vomiting. And then when he finally started feeling better at like seven o'clock that morning, I went downstairs to finally get a cup of coffee and he had the helm. And that's when I, we got hit broadside, very pretty big wave and my coffee cup went flying and then I went flying and I landed right where we have all the coffee prep stuff and wham, smashed my thumb, this one. And it was like popped up. I still don't really know what I did. I suspect that I dislocated it. Dislocated it. Dislocated it. But I don't know for sure because I didn't get an x-ray. What I do know is that it was excruciatingly painful in the, the way that it was. And so I pushed it back into place and like <laughs> cussed a lot. Oh God, I cussed a lot. I was so fucking pissed. And I didn't even think about the rum. Like I should have, I didn't have anything but a leave. A leave, so I took two a leave. Uh, we also had like a fifth of rum over in the galley that's been on the boat for like two years. Why the hell I didn't chug some rum, I will never know. But I didn't. I just pushed it back into place and went back up above. So the other things I thought were really uh, fun for this video was seeing that rocket fuselage uh, on its way to the Chesapeake, to the Chincoteague Island launch. And then three weeks later, we launched on the same day as that fuselage launched. So I thought that was kind of fun. And I enjoyed using the uh, D, 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 D. Uh, that reminds me of the Starlink. Oh, that was, that's awesome. The Starlink is fabulous. I don't know if it came across in the video, but it is actually gimbaled. Like it turns, it goes, and it does track. It's a little creepy. One of these days I'll get a video of it doing it's like looking for its mothership. <laughs> um, <coughs> until then, take my word for it. It has a bendy neck. So I think, I think that's about it. Season three is probably going to start with some projects. We are going to pull the boat out of the water and do the cutlass bearing. Just going to check the cutlass bearing. And... Oh, one of the, I painted the transducers, with transducer paint, but it was tinted. So we had no depth. We had no uh, downward looking sonar. So we need to do a little bit of work cleaning off the transducers and not using tinted transducer paint. It said transducer paint. Like, I don't, I don't know, but whatever. Um, and we're having a problem with our uh, speed indicator, the little wheel. So some takeaways there. Um, but all in all, I am so proud of Bob. And it was so cute watching Bob come out of the, in, in Delaware when they pulled him after, after we hit the rocks. Um, when they pulled him out of the water that morning and, it, and everybody thought we would have this big gash, you know, nobody really knew what we were dealing with. And up comes Bob and he's like, fucking. He's all talking shit to all the boats around. I'm like, look at me. I was on the rocks and the rocks were terrible. I'm just kidding. But uh, the people in the boat yard were very telltale. The, the, first of all, that is Angler's Marina is by far my favorite marina in the whole wide world. It is just so nice. And Lewis, Delaware is a place to visit. So I will definitely go back and uh, I can't say enough 
really, really good things about um, Angler's Marina. Mostly they were just so sweet when I told them, uh, they saw the boat, they were like, well, how long is the boat gonna be here? And I was like, a couple weeks. And the guy kind of looks at me and he's like, are you sure? And I said, well, we'll pay for a month just in case. Cause you know, I didn't know the temperature was cold and epoxy has to cure and all that jazz. And uh, he just looked at me, he's like, are you sure? Cause I'm gonna put you up front, but you know, are you sure? I was like, no, I promise we're gonna be out of here. Um, <clears throat> and then they told me how often people land on those rocks, boats land on those rocks all the time. And I wasn't kidding when I said, they, they told me it's not going to get fixed until somebody dies, which is awful. Um, I wasn't able to find anywhere in the uh, in the Coast Pilot or on the chart that really exasperated, you know, really drew it out how how bad it is right there. Uh, so obviously that's that's a little disturbing and. The locals were just really sweet and when we left, I should have gotten a video of it too, but when we left, one of the older guys that has a really cool boat, he followed us out and came by when we were anchored and waved and said hello and there was a, another boater that we met who is also a YouTuber, he's the one that took the pictures, so it was kind of cool to kind of buddy boat. Um, they had a rough trip, their boat, uh, their engine stopped offshore, they had a really hard trip. So. Um, was super appreciative to even get those photographs of Bob at Anchor. And that's it, I guess. More to come. I'd love to do a Bermuda cruise this summer. I'm happy if anybody wants to come and crew. Let me know. And uh, I think that's it. I'm going to upload this video. So y'all have a wonderful, wonderful New Year's. Happy New Year. Happy 2023. Merry Christmas. Happy Solstice. And all that stuff. I'm still fighting off a cold that I've been sort of complaining about off and on for the last like three weeks. <clears throat> I did not have COVID. I tested twice and both tests were negative. So it's just been kind of a strep throat thing, but my voice is coming back. So I thought I would go ahead and get this done. Take care of you all. I will see you all in a couple weeks. Behave. Bye.